um, so uh, our protocol again is uh, the first three months we care for the feeding of the patient so they can get uh, to the uh, I'm sorry for, again, for the interruption if you mute the laptop you're using the phone right now so just press mute on the laptop on the left so that your voice will come only from the phone without resonance Hello? Hey, if I'm saying hello, okay. Go. All right. So we do the repair for the cleft lip at the age of three, two, two to three months. And then we do the palatoplast at nine to 12 months. Uh, our technique now is a fellow with Z plus C and uh, vaccinator my mucosal flap. Uh, if we look to the anatomy of the cleft palate, it's formed by two parts. The heart palate, which is the fusion of the two maxillary processes with the pre maxilla and the soft palate, which is formed of the musculomembranous structure attached to the bony palate. Uh, we notice it's not a muscular structure, it's a musculomembranous structure, which has a, an effect on the repair, as we're going to discuss later. As we see, the, the muscles are inserted into the heart palate through the fascia of the uh, tensor uh, palatinini and not inserted that directly to, to the uh, heart palate. When you look to the cleft, this fascia or tendon is reduced to this minute part. Uh, how did the repair of the cleft ev uh, evolved? It, it, it started more than 150 years ago by the uh, uh, von Legnerberg repair, which is looked at the cleft part as, as uh, the structure defect we just not need to close the gap. Uh, we just freshening at the edge and a switching of the uh, both sides together. And if we need to uh, do a lateral lexic incision to allow approximation without tension. And this uh, uh, concept stayed for more than a hundred years and with sm certain modifications uh, in the late 1960s with advances in the speech evaluation and assessment uh, many noticed that that this repair is always or in majority of case, cases is uh, uh, accompanied by speech uh, problems so the concept of just closing the gap have evolved into uh, uh, a, a functional closure which needs lengthening of the palate to uh, diminute the velopharyngeal incompetence which occurs later. Uh, this was uh, revolutionized by Dr. Kenesal and Jansen Baradak by gaining more lens by different techniques, uh, pushback or VY geometrical tools with borrowing from the uh, heart palate. I used to do this technique for more than 15 years and this is a standard the technique in our university for uh, uh, tens of years, actually. Uh, it's a very simple technique. You just raise uh, mucoprios, the flap from both sides, and reconstruct the palate again. The addition of the pushback is complete disinsertion of the muscle from the heart palate, and then re suturing them in the expected normal position in the back. Uh, however, this repair, which seems good and, and solid, and easy to perform, but the problem is usually it ends in a straight line, and by default, straight line always contracts. Uh, as you see, we can do that in uh, cleft soft palate and complete cleft palate and, and cleft uh, uh, lip and palate. Uh, and one of its problems is you leave a de big denoted area, and this will eventually affect growth. 
the two flap, as I said, that it has many uh, uh, advantages. It's an easy to learn and widely performed all over the world. Uh, you can directly visualize a new vascular particle and you can skeletonize it so as to move the flap back with as much as you can. It needs a very short loading curve. So simple to, to teach and, and the residents and the fellows to acquire its uh, uh, ticks in, in a very short time. However, the repair ends in a straight line. And if you leave a large area, you are, result in a maxillary collapse and gross affection and the speech outcome is uh, not very good. Uh, uh, this lasted, as I said, for more than 150 years. Uh, but in the early 80s, Do you need any help, Trondo? Okay, so for now, the poll I've used for the cleft palate, uh, maybe about 90 participants uh, have contributed. Uh, I encourage everyone to, uh, to, uh, to place their option or their choice, uh, even if you're not usually uh, doing such surgery, just uh, with your uh, theoretical learning, just place uh, whatever it's suitable you think an option. Okay. Oh, if I'm Back again. Uh, with more advances in evaluation of the uh, speech and, and uh, investigations done, we found that we didn't reach the uh, utmost or, or the best repair for the cleft. Then came uh, Dr. Furlow in the early 80s with his generic idea of having a double opposing D plus C. Uh, which is a form of dynamic repair, which you lengthening the palatal tissue, rearrange the muscle in the back of the palate in its normal place. You don't borrow from the hard palate or leave a denuded area. And in the same time, some uses a relaxing incision or not. Um, this function or dynamic uh, uh, repair have been evolved since the late 80s till now by uh, Richard Kitchener, Joseph Lucy, and Dr. Robert Mann. Uh, the idea was to have the muscles uh, reoriented to the back of the palate, and in the same time have two flaps that meet in the back of the palate. One of them have the mucosa and, and the muscle on the oral side in one layer, and the other side having the mucosa and the nasal mucosa, sorry, the muscles and the nasal mucosa in the other layer. Uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult to learn, but when, once you master it, you know how you do your place. And, uh, and then came the concept of anatomical palatal restoration with Dr. Robert Mann in the early 2000s. He defined that the cleft palate is a deficiency of the muscles of the mucosa and reorientation of the muscles in the back. And in the same time, there is a part that's most important, which is the fascia, uh, which has to be reconstructed again. When you look to, to the, all the drawings of the anatomy of the cleft, you find this area of the tendon of the tensor palatii, which is a fascial, keeping the elevator away from the heart palate. So he added the usual vaccinator in the cleft palate, which I'm going to uh, explain it in, in you have to know that you have to have your tools ready for surgery so the instruments you have to have a magnification a fine uh, long tip tools the uh, diathermy needles the colorado needle you have to prepare everything for you and the sutures uh, uh, the best sutures is to use these small needles uh, the 13 millimeters, the TF or the P3 needles for the repair. Again, the, our protocol is to do the primary cleft at the three, uh, two to three months. Uh, we use the nasal alpha molding. This is uh, from our orthodontics. We use it. We refer the patient once he got to us in the first months. We refer him to our orthodontics. 
uh, our fellow Dr. Muhammad Abdul Ghafoor, he's the one who does the work for us, and Dr. Hassan Musa. Uh, this is his slides, actually, and we have papers uh, uh, accepted in the Clean Official Journal uh, in the next few months will be published about his new technique of having the computer assisted, you know, the orthodontics uses, use these slides with um, many animations. Uh, he, he called this the computer assisted uh, nasoalveolar molding. Uh, he makes the plates uh, prior to the patients he comes. He takes the measurements the first time and he changes it every two weeks. And as you see, he approximated a lot and reformed the arch actually in a circular manner rather than in a triangular one. So we do the lip repair uh, at the age of three months. We have uh, we do a, a modified Millard technique, and we do the anterior palatal closure. If you look to the uh, complete cleft lip and palate, uh, you you have three areas you have to uh, reform completely: the area of the lip, the area of the alveolus, and the hard palate, and the soft palate. Uh, we actually use the um, anterior palatal closure during the last uh, ten years. Uh, we reverted here. Hello. Hello? Hello? Hello. Okay. Um, so we raise the mucoprioceptive from the vomerine bone and then undermine it into the heart palate. And that's the complete closure of the anterior palate with the nasal lining. And recently, we add the, the ALF lab from this side to augment the nasal closure. And that the result after the surgery, this is immediately, and this is before the palate repair. So it closes the difficult place, is the nasoalveolar place, which is hard to close if you close the lip only in the beginning of the protocol, and then you try to close it during the palate repair. And this is a close up for the closure of the anterior palate. So you just have to close the soft palate alone. And then we do the uh, furlough with the vaccinator following that. This is our results. And you, as you see with gross, the face, the, the face changes. So. We don't do a lot of the nasal uh, repair during, during the lip repair. We just do a semi-closed dissection and try to rearrange the muscle in, in a proper position and lengthen the glomella and uh, close the lip below it. We don't use rim incision, we don't use uh, stents, so we don't use interdomal sutures. And in bilateral, we do it either in um, single uh, stage closure or uh, double stage uh, closure. And as you see here, you have a balanced lip. The nose is very broad, but we leave this for the other plastic surgeon who can correct it, the, the nose nicely, 
with having this a lot of a skin and a virgin place to work on. So we're gonna talk now about the palette repair, our technique we use. Uh, the the ferlu, you have four flaps, two on the oral side and two on the nasal side. So you have to define four nomination for the each flap. You have to, to name it whether it, it's right or left, whether it's oral or, or nasal, anterior or posterior base, mucosal or myomucosal flap. So the first flap is the right one. Uh, we start by the right. Uh, gonna be anterior base, nasal, mucosa flap. Uh, once you raise it, so once you raise it, you can see the direction of the mass is directed anteriorly. is directed anteriorly uh, toward the heart palate. And once you see the mucosa flare, once you release it, this is the, the lens you gain in the muscle. The second layer is the right nasal posteriorly based myomucosal flap. And also see when you release the muscles from the heart palate, you find the muscle takes its normal places backward. Then on the left side, we start of, with the raising of the right, of the left, sorry, left or posterior base myomucosal flaps. One thing that you know that the posterior base flaps are always containing the muscles and the anterior base flap are used only mucosa. So the left side, will be an oral myomucosal uh, posterior base flap and then you cut the left nasal gonna be anterior base mucosal flap and here's the after closure the, the nasal layer as you notice now that the muscles are suited in the back and we don't cross the muscles to the other side, actually. We usually leave them to reach just the middle line line and just overlap in the edges here. And then we release the right oral mucosa, anterior base flap. We don't stretch it to the other side, actually. We just leave it to reach the middle line. And then we fill the space here with uh, myomucosal From these photos, you're gonna see how much we gain lens of the palate and how much we position the uh, muscles in, in the back. When you look at the picture here, you can see the base of the viola, while after the repair, you can't even see it, it's touching the posterior wall. Uh, here is another case of uniniatric flap, uh, completely flat. We did an anterior palatal closure, and this is how the palate looks after the heart palate is closed during the primary. And this is after uh, complete repair, and this after six months. The flap is maintained in the place, and the muscles is backwards. In another case, after 12 months for up. Even in wider cleft, you can use a double vaccinator. 
and he's show you how much the bug, why the vaccinator filling the uh, anterior pillar and pushing the muscle back. We we propose that that w w positioning of the flap in an L shape matter helps in reconstruction of the palatal fascia. And here we can see after two years, the palatal muscles placed backwards, very lengthy palates, which surely helps in, in, in speech. And uh, some postulated the problem of the, uh, the donor side. This is the, after one year, there's no deformity in the cheek. We did a study on a 75 patient uh, early in, the, in, in, in our prep. And we found there's a 25% of the actual length. We had a complication rate of 4.2% as usual. We we noted we concluded that 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 the using of a box need to mine because of lab for primary left with the furlough will help in sleeting and restoring the anatomy, the reconstruction of the mucosa and fascia. Restoring the function and lensing the palate and the muscle uh, and we need a speech follow-up. Uh, we need face growth. Uh, we need to study the effect of it after uh, uh, ten or twelve years. From our results, we can see the results are consistent. And this is the impression we take to follow up the cross. Here, I'm going to show the video for the operation. Hope it works. Uh, we start here by marking of the um, uh, duct first on the left by the suture. We close the uvula first, then we start raising the right myomucosa flap. Then we insert muscles. from the posterior shelf of the heart palate. We leave three or five millimeters from the nasal mucosa attached to the heart palate, so can we can close the suture uh, of the nasal area. Then on the left side, we raise the mucor my mucosa flap posterior base. Use the thermi very few during the dissection. Okay. Wait. We can hear you quite well, Trondo. You can go ahead. Hello? Everything is going well. We can hear you quite well, Trondo. Right? Uh, we can hear you quite well. You can go ahead. Okay. The video is going well. Um, we, uh, we can hear you well. Okay. Okay, we just close the nasal and as you see we're getting the oral layer the muscles is usually meeting in the middle line rather than overlapping in each each other we can take one or two suture for the muscles
and as you see the right flap just crosses the middle layer and then we prepare the bed for the vaccinator we raise the flap the suture as you see here is just two three three millimeters below the box the parota duct Any recommendation, Dr. Amdouh, when you're raising the vaccinator flap? You we mentioned try it. to keep uh, just a very thin layer of the muscles over the buccal pad or fat, but occasionally, sometimes it's open, so just close it by one or two sutures. Yes. So, okay, we're going to see. This is the pre operator and this is the post op So this is for the cleft palate during the first year of life. Our second segment will be taking care of the cleft to the age of 12 years. In the period from the first year towards preschool age, we just have to follow up the middle ear fraction because many of the patients we had a study that we did in, in children hospital of the cleft patients, we found that 67 of the cleft patients have secretory otitis media preoperatively, and less than half of that would improve after surgery. Uh, so some improved by medical treatment, and about the third have a persistent secretory otitis media to have a, a ventilation tube postoperatively. So our protocol is not to do a ventilation tube as a routine for, for all patients as some center does us. We follow the patients for so six to 12 months postoperatively, and if, if we find they have a persistent secretory rights media, we do a ventilation tube for sepsis. As for speech, we start assessing at the age of three to four years, and you will have a, a special uh, presentation by Dr. Ahmad Ashens next week about, about the well uh, evaluation and training. Uh, for second left surgery, we have two problems uh, the fistula and the very incompetence. Uh, the fistula rate, rate ranges from many publications between 5 to 20 percent. In our hands, it's, it's about 5 to 7 percent. Uh, what are the causes of lateral fistulas? It's either a surgeon or a patient factors. The surgeon, which is most important for us, is the tension corrosion. If you close it, the palate under tension, it will break down. The other problem is the vascular injury, which is should not be happening with a with a, a well trained surgeon. Patient factors are either infection or trauma, having a hard objects, at, um, having hard objects into the mouth, which is occasionally happens in missions. Uh, so when we're having a palatal piece, you have to evaluate it properly, uh, either according to the size of the piece for classification, the size and the condition of local tissue. Uh, having multiple surgeries, adds to fibrosis and results in, in more fish. Uh, for the timing, we always wait for, for one year after the previous intervention. And the key for success is to have a two layer closure. So what are the options we have? We have either to use a local tissue or a palate repair or to use a vaccinator as a REN or axial as a fan flame. Use of LR there, labial flaps, tongue flaps, and last thing is the is flaps. We're going to by some of the cases, uh, our techniques that we use. This is a case of a, a, a large anterior fistula, which is actually the easiness of, of the, the mucoprosia flaps of the repair. So we just did the 
uh, uh, freshening of the edge, mobilization of two palatal flaps, and closure. Use of labial flap, we usually use it when, when we do alveolar bone graft at the age of nine years. The use of box and eater here as a random flap. Or we can use it with the furlough if you have a short flap. As you see here, you can see the direction of the muscle getting anteriorly. So we're getting the whole muscle in the back with a Z plus C and in the field of a, of a vaccinator flesh. Is also this is a platter business, so we did a furlough with a vaccinator. Another option of using a vaccinator is using an axial flap, which is a facial artery. It's a fan flap, facial artery, myomenocausal flap. And this is very helpful when you use it anteriorly based to close an anterior wide fissure. Another option is a tongue flap. And just one of you to take a, a, a closer look to the shape of the palate. This is a patient that did, did a two flap palatoplasty, and you can see the palatal collapse. As for the VP, VPI, very financial competence, we usually start at the age of four years, assessment by clinical examination, nasal endoscopy. Uh, this is the main stay for uh, examination we use and uh, other center use video fluoroscopy. We prefer nasal endoscopy because it shows the pattern of closures, the palatal movements, and the palatal muscles. Uh, also for the management, it's a deep assessment. We uh, spend time evaluating the patient with the speech pathologist and the speech therapist. So as to, uh, uh, choose the timing, the procedures, and to explain to the parents the expectations. We have different options, whether palatal lensing or pharyngeal syringes. Just doing a furlough here will lengthen the cleft. Here is the furlough with a box senator. Another case with a furlough with a box for the lengthening of the patient. As you see, also, this is a palatal collapse. It's the thing that we noticed from the two flap palate pluses that we did a few years later. Finally, harmony of the muscle natural action is needed for the failure of competence loan. And here is the uh, step for the speech pathologists and speech therapists to jump in. And the achievement, achievement you get when you get from this uh, short message from one of our patients. When you get the result from a flexible nasal for pharyngoscopy, and at the same time you get this uh, message from your patient, and this is the English trans translation for our foreign attendees. Finally, you owe our patient a lot, and uh, what I get from the book of wonder if you got a magic lamp and you have one wish that one wish is to have a normal looking fees and a speech that no one ever can notice how about the future the future we are looking to the two different ways was there a fetal surgery the allograft bioinductive and tissue engineering materials but what i think is very important is the gene therapy for familiar cases it was a science fiction in 2000s, became a dream in 2003. When it will become a cure, we're waiting for that. It's a teamwork 
and our internet uh, cleft family helped us a lot in our progress and we learn from each other you have to know that you have to plan unless you want to fail if you fail to plan you are planning to fail and you will bear sequence it's a multi-stage place procedure uh, efficient and long term follow up is needed and uh, you have to accept a very good patient doctor relationship you have to talk to your parents and listen to your patient this is our ref reference instances that you going to look at for the updated information for cleft and you have to always remember the best surgeon knows well when not to operate i used to finish my presentation with this photo of one of my patients that her father sent me her photo during her engagement and then a few years later we tried to get like the new generation doing he she and her brothers having the same picture when their others one year later she comes with her first son having a bilateral cleft lip and palate so always know that your work never ends it left is is affecting our life and you have it in many monuments for our foreign attendees some of the rooms that tut moon had a sub mucus cleft and if you take a basal view for his, for for his uh, mask you will find it similar to sub mucus cleft thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Omdua, for such uh, an interesting and detailed uh, presentation. I'm sure the connection errors maybe have affected some, but uh, after all, uh, this is one of the advantages of online meeting, but yet we have uh, the privilege of hearing you out and every one of us uh, could reach you. So thank you again for such an interesting and insightful presentation. Um, Dr. Dalo, do you have a question for Dr. Omdua? Yeah, th uh, thank you, Dr. Omdua, for this nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. There's someone here asking about the uh, the vaccinator flap was uh, the primary repair in uh, cleft uh, palate. Uh, and uh, they are asking if you are uh, just uh, taking tissues and uh, using this in the primary repair and you may need it for the secondary repair. I hope you can answer this question. Yes, I, actually, I, I had the same problem during the first early cases that I'm uh, burning out my options for a second for a second operation. But actually when I started using, I found that it, you can use one side mainly and keep the other side for the second uh, step if you need it. Actually, most of the cases, if, even if you needed the uh, uh, vaccinator, you can rotate the the back end of it uh, and actually there is a very good presentation for the technique more in detailed ways by dr robert mann and i hope he can uh, get into one of our webinars uh, to be the give his presentation fully Uh, okay, thank you. Also, I would like to ask you uh, another question. You mentioned uh, from a while about the repair of the nose uh, while uh, repairing the during primary lip repair. So I want you to uh, tell us why you don't uh, interfere with the nose because uh, uh, you know the plastic surgeon like to repair the nose and uh, to uh, keep it in a good shape uh, while in the first operation. Um, okay, I know that uh, my beginning of training is actually a pediatric surgery uh, have made me fear a lot of doing uh, nasal correction. Uh, 
I've attended in many places the uh, repair of primary rhinoplasty uh, with either a rare incision and uh, or even open rhinoplasty. My concept is that you have a, a deficiency in the base of the of your nose. Uh, the cleft you have uh, a deficient bony support for the nasal tissues, whether a cartilage or skin. So whatever the, you do in the first few years, it will be altered by the deficient skeleton. The other factor that affects everything is the gross. We don't know the gross of every patient. And it is very unique to everybody. Everyone has, a, has his own gross curves and which is going to grow more or less. So I, I try to make things easier for the secondary procedures. And my question for my colleagues of plastic, other plastic surgeon here, what do you prefer to do? Uh, rhinoplasty on a fresh tissue and excess tissue skin uh, at your desire? or a previously repaired uh, rhinoplast with a grafts and multiple scars in the septum or in the columellan. Well, of course, it makes sense to Mandoha, your point, uh, having a fresh tissue to work on later on, but maybe we had a poll on that and we'll be sharing the results soon. Uh, but first, uh, Dr. Khaled Makin, uh, you wanted a question, you wanted to address um, thank you, the meeting? Thank you, my dear friend Mamdouh uh, Abu Hassan, about this uh, extremely nice presentation. Um, and I welcome all our guests from different universities. And I think we have Dr. Hanmi uh, Shalabi, Dr. Rael Saar, Dr. Abdul Mufti. I won't uh, let me forget anyone, Dr. Magdi Abdul Muqtadir. And I know, I know a lot of our Dr. Atif Imam Ashur. Uh, before we have um, 10 minutes presentation by our registrar, Haysan Malahi, I need to uh, hear some comments from our uh, guests about the techniques uh, or the presentation of Dr. Mamdou. Of course, right. we have some uh, raised hands. Uh, if anyone needs to comment, just raise a hand to direct the question. Well, Dr. Helmi Shalabi, I'll be unmuting you. السلام عليكم. السلام. حلمي أنا كنت أحلف بالله العظيم إن أنت أول واحد هتتكلم. الله يكرمك يا رب يا دكتور خالد ويخليك لي يا رب. اتفضل يا فرلو. لا يا بي <تصفيق> أصل الحقيقة دي دي الحقيقة وعجبني يعني. أولاً متشكر لممدوح دكتور حلمي كان يو سبيك إن إنجلش بليز؟ يس يس. ثانك يو دكتور ممدوح فيري ويل يو هاف بريزنتد Uh, this uh, lecture very well, uh, but I have some comments uh, regarding the last question about the uh, nasal dissection in the primary repair of uh, cleft lip. Uh, since we uh, have started uh, in the beginning of 1990 uh, in the CSMED thesis of uh, Professor, now he is Professor. Uh, uh, an old professor, uh, Dr. Said uh, Abdelrazi, uh, his uh, thesis was on the uh, correction of the nose, primarily with cleft lip at the age of uh, early three months or less. And we were comparing uh, the McComb and Thompson, and we uh, have reached to the conclusion that McComb is less invasive in its uh, technique, in its uh, dissection, and it is, uh, it can, it gives a very good uh, nasal shape. Uh, regarding the effect of the dissection on the growth of the nose, we haven't found, uh, now we, we are about uh, 25 or more years, no effect on the growth of the nose have been noticed in these uh, patients. 
uh, this one uh, comment. The second comment is on the during your uh, cleft, uh, we also use a millard repair, but we dissect the lateral uh, muscle and the medial muscle, and we make these two muscles three uh, three slips, and each slip uh, interdigitate the three uh, digits from uh, each side, interdigitate uh, on both. Uh, uh, size of the incision, so it increase this uh, insertion increases the uh, uh, like the pyramid of the uh, uh, filtrum of the uh, yes of filtrum. Uh, this is the second uh, comment. Uh, I agree with you. Very very good. The fair look technique is efficient and is orienting and is dynamic for repair of uh, uh, incomplete cleft palate. In wide and complete cleft palate, you have to use vaccinator myomucosal flap. The point in the dissection of the vaccinator myomucosal flap, as one of our colleagues asked, you have to be sharp dissection in the uh, very beginning at the oral commissure and the, the uh, uh, remaining part of the section uh, can be done in plant dissection. So you may uh, preserve the uh, buccal mucosa, the buccal fat, or bad of fat, and at the same time, you don't injure the branch coming to the uh, disc lab from the, uh, uh, above the turbobalatine membrane, or, or ligament, turbobalatine ligament. Uh, the, for the dissection of the vaccinator. Uh, the point that must be uh, 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 recorded in the notes of the patient that he has a vaccinator because uh, some of our colleagues from ENT uh, ask for cutting the pedicle of this flap. Uh, and they consider it uh, a, a strange uh, thing. Uh, but I agree with, uh, with other uh, points that you uh, raised in this uh, uh, very good lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Helmi. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Robert, uh, first, please, I welcome you to our uh, meeting now in Cairo University. And I want to ask you about your opinion in, um, in primary nasal repair during lab repair and uh, also to answer the question about uh, if ENT surgeons um, in your university are uh, uh, having problems while uh, making their operations, uh, like uh, Dr. Hemi said, uh, from a while. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. First, I'd, I'd really like to thank everybody for inviting me. Uh, it's always wonderful to listen to mom to talk. Congratulations on 20 years of palate surgery. Fantastic. Uh, this is, as you all know, one of my favorite places. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Um, someone commented about using the buccinator muscle uh, flaps early and maybe needing them to wait till later. I'm gonna make one comment on my experience all my major complications are using them secondarily. When I use them primarily, my success rate in speech is 93.4%. If you have to use them secondarily, you only get about 85%. So you're gonna get more action from your buccinator flaps if you use them early. I always think about it like raising a child. If you get them out on the right start, they do better. So fix the palate right the first time and you won't have the problem, so don't save it, because you can, as Mom just said, reuse them. But the most important thing is get a great result the first time. Um, with regard to uh, things where Mom and I do a little bit differently, I, I don't do unlined vomer flaps um, for scarring reasons. Uh, in my, I've been in practice now 35 years, so I have a little longer history with that, and I, I do think anything that you're doing in the, in the gingival area does have a growth restriction issue. And if you reduce every growth restriction issue, you're gonna have the best result. If you have one that isn't, you know, if you're doing still one thing that is growth restricting, you're probably getting a good result. But 
my orthodontists don't like teeth that are end to end, they still like them overlapping. With regard to primary nasal reconstruction, um, when I was in Australia a few years ago where Dr. McComb had, uh, was uh, very well thought of, but now there's huge problems with the McComb repair, unfortunately, and it's not due to growth, it's due to the scarring. Uh, the scarring is, is uh, when they hit their adolescent, the, the scarring itself is the inhibition. inhibition. Uh, it's not the, the, the growth restrictions. There's a lot of studies that, that show there's growth. It just creates deformations. So I, I try to do septoplasty, which doesn't create a problem. I do nasal base work. I do, an, my philosophy is very simple. I get fantastic results in incomplete clefts. All of us do. But if I do complete clefts, they're problematic. So I take my complete cleft and make it a physiologic incomplete cleft. I don't do a lip adhesion. Lip adhesion is a bad operation because it doesn't readjust the muscles off the nose. My first operation is essentially a rhinoplasty, but I don't do intranasal tip work. It's all base work, and I'll, I'll, I don't release the cartilages because they're too um, fragile at that age. And I can round out the nostrils. I can get them so that they can get a very nice shape on my secondary rhinoplasty. I've been doing that, or second stage of the, of the uh, uh, lip repair. I've been doing this now for about 20 years. And certainly the second half of my career, my, my noses and lips have needed far less revisions. So that's the answer to that question. And I'm, as I Thank say, I, mom to nose, I'll be happy to uh, go in, in detail at, a, at another talk anytime you want me to do a Zoom lecture, I'll, I'll work with any individual surgeon or any uh, um, uh, center. So, but thank okay, you again. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Robert, thank you about this uh, nice comment. Um, and Dr. I, Robert, I, think I, I just shared the, the poll results, uh, maybe relating to what uh, Dr. Robertman has just talked about regarding the primary rhinoplasty at the time of uh, lip repair. Uh, so maybe first, we, if, we, if it's possible to talk, I'll maybe share the results. Uh, maybe you had 30%, which is close to 26%, uh, saying that cartilage dissection and transdomal interdomal sutures are the way to go for them. Others maybe thought that cartilage dissection and release only uh, is okay. That's close percentage. Um, the least of them used stents and tajima sutures. So at that point, maybe just cause the section and others using uh, sutures are the highest uh, percentage. Thank you, Ahmed. And um, I welcome, we have um, uh, our dear friend, Dr. Osama Shahat, I think the head of the department at Al-Azhar University. And um, also saw the name of Dr. Nabil al Dusui and Dr. Yes, Mahmoud al-Bistar. Dr. Osama al-Shahat being, is being unmuted just Dr. now. Dr. Osama, if you need, uh, if, you, if you have any comment, can you please? Yes, please, yes. you have the mic. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor Abul Hassan, uh, Professor Khalid Bakin, Dr. Ahmed Safat, Dr. Dawlat Amara. Uh, I have a comment regarding the nasoalveolar molding. I completely agree with Professor Abul Hassan said before. It has a great benefit for the patient, but I prefer to use it in the first two in the first week or 10 days maximum to get the maximum benefit and regarding the simultaneous repair of the left lip with rhinoplasty at the time of lip repair three months uh, i have an experience more than 10 years in like uh, in similar uh, cases and i have a good result uh, so the simultaneous repair of lip with rhinoplasty, it gives you a good result if the deformity is minimal. And it will improve if the deformity is severe. What I do is called sailor technique. Through the mallard incision, I dissect the skin from the underlying cartilaginous skeleton through two approaches, the C flap at the base of the columella and the alar base, freeing all the attachment or attachment with the cartilaginous skeleton. And I take the tajima suture from the 
depressed uh, lower lateral cartilage on the cleft side to the contralateral upper lateral cartilage. This is regarding the simultaneous repair. And I have a question for Professor Abul Hassan regarding the fan flap or the vaccinator mycosal flap. Uh, I see there is a pedicle for this flap which necessitates a separation to expose the posterior alveolus for tooth eruption later on. And thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Osama. Hello? We can hear you, but maybe lower the voice Hello? a bit, Trondo. Oh, that's okay. I can hear you. Samani? Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Osama, for your comment. Uh, the first thing that uh, the Salier technique, I was trained to do that with Dr. Salier, actually, and this was the thing that I did for several years. Um, the problem is that I, when I see the secondary rhinoplasty done, either the preschool age or as the fourth, adulthood, you find a lot of fibrosis from this dissection. And you can reach an acceptable result. I won't say it's a, a, a fine result by just a minor dissection about the ailer base and in the uh, filtral area. And rearranging the muscle uh, in a proper position would achieve 80 or 90 percent of the normal shape. The most important thing that the follow-up of the patient, you always find that the nose will not stay uh, as symmetrical as you have it on table. You're going to have a very good results on table. Just six or eight months later, you'll find uh, deformity and asymmetrical shapes, and this will continue till the full adulthood, where you do your full nasal correction, actually, and septal uh, uh, correction, rather than the deviation that you have during the uh, time of loss. So I try to be as minimal as I can uh, in, in uh, managing the uh, primary repair, actually. And I can show you a um, uh, hundred of cases that we did that we have acceptance of the parents also for the nasal shape, uh, not only the, ch the, ch the children. Thank you, so Dr. I, I, I would advise for that. The second question about the vaccinator. Uh, we, uh, uh, till now, we started doing that the last five years very few times that we needed to cut the pedicle of the flap actually. We just uh, we, we didn't do it as a routine. We leave it if the patient has a problem. It doesn't cover actually the, um, the uh, eruption of teeth. Uh, it never interferes with that. But sometimes it has a, a slight groove that annoys the patient during swallowing or uh, remains of food stayed there. So that's the time we, uh, when we have to put them into a just a simple sleep and cut it uh, in a few by the day. Thank you, Dr. Mamdouh, for your insight. Dr. Khaled Makin, you're still with us? Yes. Um, so next, would you like to see the other technique or what, how would you like to proceed? Yes, but first, uh, Ahmed, uh, if I yes. have a comment yes. of our uh, uh, guests, Dr. Majid Al-Mufti, Dr. Uh, Nabil, yes. Dr. al Sa'ir. Dr. Bastar, Dr. Mahmoud, he is an NT surgeon, and Dr. Nabil is a pure pediatric surgeon. And they have any comments about this, we can share it with them. Just a oh, can I say something about uh, Dr. Nabil is, is my professor in pediatric surgery, and Mahmoud uh, Fauzi is uh, my long life colleague in cleft care and craniofacial care, actually, and we why have why a long history together. Opinion, this is why. Okay, Dr. Mahmoud. Nabil, the is with us. Uh, Mahmoud Fawzi. Mahmoud. Uh, Dr. Nabil, the is with us. He's unmuted. And can we hear you? Okay, maybe he's out of reach. Uh, there are two no, questions no. here on the uh, chat. Can I... Uh, uh, please address them. Dr. Khaled, help Dr. Hayat, please. Unmute Mahmoud, Mahmoud, Mahmoud Fawzi. Unmute him. Mahmoud Fawzi al Bistar. Unmute him. Mahmoud Fawzi al Bistar. We can hear you, Mr. Bistar. Good evening, everybody. And, uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mamdouh, and uh, Dr. Khaled Makin, for their beautiful work. Uh, I also want to, work, to welcome Bob, and I can see Mike there as well. 
Uh, anyway, uh, regarding the, the nose, what I think is that it has two problems, um, skeletal problem and soft tissue problem. Uh, my personal view is that um, trying to manipulate the skeletal problem in primary lip repair, to me, doesn't um, is not very attractive because um, all you can do is reposition by sutures, and this is going to change anyway, as Mandur said. So I guess that the best thing to be done in primary lip repair for the nose is to be very uh, careful and enthusiastic to put the soft tissues together. And I mean by the soft tissues, the alar base, the nasal floor, the nasal cell, and the hemicolumellar uh, part of the, the, the hemicolumellar. Uh, I believe that if you manage to put, uh, to create a nice cell, a well-located nasal uh, alar unit and the hemicolumellar length maybe with the C-flap with the Millard repair, I guess this is all what needs to be done as a primary and then leave the tissues undisturbed because probably after the age of 18 or so, uh, you are needed to augment, you need to strengthen the lower lateral cartilage on the cleft side using grafts and you need also to correct the septum because the septum in most cases is severely deviated to the non-cleft side. So I guess, uh, to wrap it up, that the best thing to do is to concentrate on the soft tissue element and postpone the skeletal element for me. And I appreciate uh, for giving me the chance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, now we have a short presentation about our registrar, Haysim Malahi. I think it will be um, a nice talk. Can we listen, Haysim, please? Go ahead. This presentation will be regarding um, different technique or modification to Fairlow's classic technique. Go ahead, Ace. This technique uh, we're running right now, uh, Naburish, my to Rahmat Hashim, on this version of Rahmat Hashim to Dawlet. He's here with us. Rahmat Hashim with us? Yes. 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 Go ahead. Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, I want to uh, give a special thanks for my professor, uh, Dr. Khaled McKean, to give me this chance to speak about uh, modified ferloballatoplasty. Uh, special thanks for my professor, uh, Dr. Mamdouh Abul Hassan. Uh, I am so honored to be here with you uh, today. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Ahmed Safwat for great effort uh, in organizing this meeting. And uh, endless thanks for my best mentors, uh, Professor Ahmed Hashim and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Adawla Tamar. I will uh, present today the modified furlough palatoplasty uh, Cairo University uh, Hospital experience. Sorry, Dr. Ahmed. As we know, the ideal palatoplasty should achieve uh, palatal uh, closure, uh, normal speech, and velopharyngeal uh, function without fistula formation and uh, facial growth impairment. Uh, as we know, uh, Fairlow is a well-recognized uh, technique for primary palatal repair and for treatment of uh, selected cases of the velopharyngeal dysfunction. Since its description by uh, Leonard Fairlow in 1978, uh, he described the new elegant technique for palatal repair, which is double opposing uh, palatoplasty or double opposing flaps in the oral and nasal mucosa. He firstly uh, expressed his work in the annual meeting of uh, uh, Southeastern Plastic Surgeon in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, furlough palatoplasty has uh, dual purposes, which is the, uh, we know the lengthening effect of the Z-plasty. The second thing, he prevent the contracture of the scar because it is not a straight line uh, technique. Uh, since it is description, uh, the technique has uh, modified uh, or undergone several modifications uh, in the hands of eminent surgeons worldwide, uh, each of them attempting to improve the closure, especially in the cases of wide cleft. One of the good modifications is the uh, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia modifications. Uh, Richard, uh, Professor Richard Kirchner, uh, with his team, uh, introduced this modification. Uh, which include the uh, ferro uh, palatoplasty with five modifications. The first modification is lateral re re relaxing incision of bone lingam back type. 
the second modification is undermining of the uh, uh, mucopriosteal undermining of the heart palate. The third modification is the dissection of the uh, soft palate to the space of Ernst. The four, uh, uh, fourth modifica modification is the infracture of uh, uh, trigoid hamulus. And the fifth modification is the uh, stretching of neurovascular pendle. Uh, this is the modification. We add some of our modifications in the upper range hospital. Okay, so our modification, we follow the CHOP modification, which is the relaxing uh, incision of more lingambic type, myocopriosteal undermining of the heart palate, careful dissection of the, to the space of Ernst uh, as needed. We, uh, we made a releasing uh, of the tissues from the medial trigoid plate to relax the nasal closure complete circumferential scrutinization of the neurovascular pendle. So we uh, didn't use any uh, in, in fracture of the uh, trigoid hamulus. Okay, this uh, diagram showing the uh, uh, modified ferropalatoplasty can be used in any type of cleft. As, as we see here, it is a VO3 type cleft showing the Z-plasty of uh, uh, Ferlo and uh, lateral relaxing incision of uh, von Lingemic type. This is VO4, which is unilateral complete and bilateral complete uh, uh, Another uh, uh, re revolutional uh, uh, paper or revolutional addition to the Ferlo palatoplasty is the utilization of buccal pad fat flap. Okay, we add this into our, uh, uh, to our work in Upper Reich Hospital. This is firstly described by Benjamin Levy and uh, uh, Buckman from the, uh, uh, Michigan uh, and published th their work in 2008. Other paper is also in the Chicago, uh, published by Cecil Kui, uh, is the prophylactic use of buccal fat fat flap, which uh, improved the oral, heal uh, oral mucosal healing in, uh, in addition to the modified phalatoplasty. Uh, so our technique is a chop modification plus buccal fat flap. Uh, our surgical technique in operation hospital, uh, as we uh, uh, described in the last week, or Dr. Adolat Amara described the protocol of uh, cleft palate or cleft patient. We follow this protocol until the patient uh, uh, arriving to the uh, uh, operation theater. So uh, we start with marking. I will show you a very rapid video on the marking of modified fellow palatoplasty. Okay. The, the first step in the marking is the palpation and marking of the trigoid hamulus bilaterally. This is the first step. The second step is the marking of the hard soft palate on the left side of the uh, patient or of the palate. Then a line is drawn from the uh, uh, left trigoid hamulus to the uh, uh, soft uh, uh, hard palatal junction, making an angle of about 60 degree with the longer axis of the uh, uh, of the cleft. On the right side, we draw a line uh, extending from the base of the veovula to the right trigoid hamulus, making an angle which is more obtuse than the the, the left side angle with the longer axis of the uh, of the cleft. A lateral releasing incision starting from a maxillary tuberosity and uh, extending anteriorly to the heart palate. I hope uh, the video will be uh, is illustrative. Uh, on the left side, we will see how the lateral relaxing incision ex extending from the maxillary tuberosity in the pre coronal region uh, anteriorly to the heart palate. This is the final marking. After marking, we infiltrate the ballot with uh, saline adrenaline, one uh, for uh, or one pair, uh, 100,000 concentration. Then we proceed with the technique. I will show you another uh, short video for a technique we follow in the operations. Uh, firstly, uh, as Dr. Mamdouh said, and uh, uh, it is the, uh, firstly we dissect the oral layer. On the left side, it is uh, uh, the oral layer contain a myomycosal flap 
with now dissecting the muscle from the abnormal insertion. On the right side is only mucosal flap. These, uh, uh, the first limbs of the, or the first Z, the, this the Z also transposed into the uh, uh, nasal layer, but in the mirror image. This is the lateral relaxing incision extending from the uh, uh, maxillary tuberosity anterior in the pericronal region of the maxillary teeth bilaterally. On this side, you don't connect them, Mason. Dr. Ahmed? I understand that you don't connect the both incisions, the lateral racing incisions, you don't connect them at the midline. Yes. Here, showing the extent, uh, the extent I, will, I will tell them, the here uh, showing the extent of dissection, okay? And this is the skeletonization of the... Uh, pause it, please, Aysen. Defendant? Pause it. If you could pause and show us the vessel. Okay. So, point towards it, please. This is the uh, greater palatine vessels after complacent conferential skeletonization. Okay. We did this uh, in bilaterally. After that, uh, we dissect and uh, uh, freed all the tissue from medial trigoid plate bilaterally and, and uh, uh, to aim to uh, tension free closure of the nasal layer. As we see here, this is the nasal layer completely uh, uh, closed completely, showing the two limbs of the Z plus. Tension free closure. This part is the uh, myomucosal flap of the nasal layer, showing the posterior transposition of the uh, palatal muscle and reconstruction of the uh, uh, levator sling. Okay, this is the muscle in the nasal layer, and this is the muscle on the. When we are unhappy about the uh, closure of the nasal layer. We add or harvest a buccal fat uh, flap. Uh, uh, it is harvested from the buccal sulcus. Uh, the, the care should be taken not to injure the uh, parotid duct. Uh, small incision was made on the cheek and the uh, uh, harvesting of the uh, buccal fat flap uh, using a long uh, iris suture, uh, uh, scissor, sorry. Then this, this flap is interposed between the oral and nasal layer. This uh, showing how uh, the, uh, the tension-free nasal oral layer is uh, and the, the interposition of the two uh, flap of the Z without any tension uh, because of the lateral releasing incision of von Lingenbeck type. And this uh, showing how much length we gained after closure, about one and a half centimeter uh, uh, lengthening of the palate, okay? We can see here in the depth of the uh, video, uh, the, the uvula touching the posterior palatal, palatal uh, wall, the posterior pharyngeal wall here. Okay, this is our uh, uh, technique rapidly. Uh, since uh, 2017 till uh, March 2020, we retrospectively, uh, 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 we retrospectively show the data of the patient, 32 patients were identified, follow-up data only available for only 20 patients, which represent 61% of our uh, patient, 60% uh, were female and 40 patients were, were male. Uh, 19 out of 20 of our patients suffering from VO2 uh, cleft palate, and one patient, he came to us with velopharyngeal dysfunction uh, for uh, repair of velopharyngeal uh, dysfunction. He is suffering from VO4 uh, cleft palate. Uh, 16 patients, uh, uh, which represent 80% of our patients, we used uh, uh, modified ferulopalatoplasty for primary cleft palate repair, 10% for fistula closure, and 10% for velopharyngeal dysfunction. 70% uh, of our patient, uh, we use the buccal pad fat flap as adjunctive. We add uh, a vascularized layer to promote heat, healing on the overlying oral mucosal flaps. Uh, the lateral fistula was not uh, identified in our patient. And this is uh, some pictures of our follow-up uh, patient uh, uh, showing there is no fistula. Two patients of our series uh, complain of uh, nasal symptoms of uh, nasal rigor. Okay, uh, 
uh, one of the interested cases, uh, this patient came to us after one week of operation suffering from ischemia of one of the tip of the uh, flaps uh, of the oral layer, okay? Uh, so this is show how the uh, uh, Z-plasty or double opposing Z-plasty provide a vascular layer not that like the straight line repair. If there is, if there is disruption of the uh, oral layer, it may affect the nasal layer. The, uh, this uh, first week after operation, the, the picture on the left side, this uh, uh, picture after 10 days of operation, okay? And showing how the buccal pad fat flap add more vascularized layer. This is after two weeks of operation showing complete healed uh, oral mucosa. Okay, uh, 30 patient, percent of our patient underwent proper speech therapy, uh, or speech assessment by speech pathologist. Nasal endoscopy was done for them and uh, they revealed they have a very mild VPI requiring only speech uh, therapy. In uh, conclusion, modified ferlo palatoplastic technique presented uh, provides successful palatal closure with favorable pre preliminary outcome in respect of facial affirmation and nasal regard. Uh, proper speech and facial growth uh, outcome are still to be determined. Thank you for giving me this chance to express our experience in our rich hospital. Thank you for all attendees for your attention. Thank you, Ethan, for the quick uh, but detailed presentation for the different technique or modification to the fair loop. Um, I'd like to maybe um, focus on today's presentation's uh, uh, poll result, which is uh, uh, primary cleft palate repair. Which technique would you rather uh, do? Um, I've got 70% of the attendees um, voting for uh, flap, flap, flap platoplasty with its variants, uh, either pushbacks or uh, von Langenbeck. Um, 18 only for going for a further double opposing Z-plasty uh, with no adjuncts, either like a buccal flap uh, or even a vaccinator. Um, so, Dr. Mamdouh, Dr. Robert Mann, Dr. Dr. Uh, I'd like uh, to hear your comment on that, Dr. Mamdouh. I think uh, you're usually going for the vaccinator together with the, Z, with the double opposing Z-plasty, as you explained. Yeah, uh, uh, we'll, we'll let, let Dr. Robert Mann first comment on that. Of course, Sir Robert Mann. Sorry, I'm going to unmute you. Give me a second. Yes. There we go. Okay, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we yeah, can hear yes. you quite well. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Hatem. That, very well done. Um, I, I will have a couple comments. Because uh, my, my philosophy is to do an anatomic reconstruction, at the very beginning, uh, I do not use the fat from the buccinator area because there's really not any fat in the palate. So I'm not, I, it doesn't fit into the anatomic philosophy. It is a fine flap to use for fistulas at a later date, but I do not use it primarily. And if you do use it primarily and later want to use the buccinator myomucosa flap, You've created scarring within the uh, area of the base of the flap, and that can compromise the results, and I have seen that, in, unfortunately, in my experience. So I do not use it primarily. Um, I, the Z-plasty is a wonderful operation, but as you pointed out beautifully, uh, a lot of times you have to do extensive relaxing incisions, uh, which once again uh, create the vagaries of scarring, which uh, are, is another thing I think that if you reconstruct the palate anatomically with a tension-free closure and adding the tissue that's missing, the mucous membrane on both the oral and nasal lining and the tensor vili palatini aponeurosis, you're going to have a lot less uh, problems with uh, fistulas and uh, growth issues. And that certainly has been the statistics that uh, I have seen uh, in, in uh, would be happy to present at any time. Uh, but excellent presentation, and uh, once again, the furlough is a step and one type of surgery that is necessary. It is something I use uh, on the VO1s and the very small VO2s, um, uh, but anything above that, I will add one or two buckle flaps to give me the most likely uh, anatomic reconstruction. Thank you. Thank sir. you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Dr. could you give us your comments uh, yes. on this procedure? Uh, yes, um, I learned this technique from uh, Dr. Kirshner, and um, uh, we operate 
detected uh, on almost any type of uh, cleft using um, this technique of uh, the furlo this modifications, these modifications of the furlo palatoplasty. And um, we did have zero fistula rate, so we didn't have any fistulas. Uh, long term, um, there is um, no uh, effect on the cross. Um, and um, the thing about the buccal fat flap, um, um, I actually learned that uh, later on when I trained at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, I usually use it only when um, I find that the nasal layer, um, I'm not very comfortable with it. Uh, I think it's uh, there, there might be some tension or uh, a little bit of uh, because so, Rahman, the these cases, a um, can you hear us? I assist the residents doing it. Uh, yes, can you hear? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it's better right now. Yes. Can Can you hear me, Ahmed? Yes, I can hear you quite well. Okay. Okay. So uh, I was talking about the. Yes, I was talking about the buccal fat flap. I added that after I um, I learned it actually at the Cleveland Clinic by one of the. Um, one of my co-fellows who was working was Dr. Bachman. And uh, I think it's a very useful technique uh, because uh, it adds another vascularized layer between the oral and nasal uh, repair. And at the same time, it prevents the muscles from um, retracting or um, scarring uh, again towards the edge of the heart palate. Uh, so it fills in this uh, dead space. Um, so um, I use it in uh, in every type of uh, cleft. Um, um, we we didn't we didn't have any gross disturbances um, uh, long term uh, when I was doing my training with uh, Dr. Kirshner using this technique. Uh, we had zero fistula rates and um, uh, very very good speech outcomes. So that's that's my comment. Thank you, Rahman. Yes, please. Um, for, for the technique used for the left, there's always a lot of discussion which is better and which is not. Uh, that's what I mean by contrast in, in the left repair. Uh, our concept of adding the vaccinator in the furlough, the furlough itself usually have a deficient surgery at the angles of closure. Uh, whether in the oral or, or in the needs as a uh, We believe that the lateral release actually results in a massive fibroid. And in many cases, you can see after longer follow-up, you need an extensive surgery, maxillofacial advancement, or before uh, in other age. We, we believe me and Dr. Mann, that adding this tissue allowed the bones to grow freely without limitation of growth in any direction. And if you see a lot of the patient did uh, two flap palatoplasty, you see a lot of palatal collapse, which the orthodontic struggle a lot to correct in, in uh, the other age. Uh, Second comment about the time of repair of the fistula. I think six months is too short time. In many cases, as high, even high science showed that if the essence of uh, uh, one or two sutures, usually healing takes time and closes this, this small fistula or even make it minute so it's not functioning. So I usually prefer to wait for 12 months. Uh, repeated surgery results in, in repeated fibrosis, and this is surely affects growth. Thank you, Trump. So you think the, uh, the two flap platyplastry, like uh, Von Lang and Beck, or pushback, usually affects maxillary growth, being subperiosal section and all? Actually, in many studies now, after more than 30 or 48 years, in many places, they are reverted into the furlough with its modification. And if you were attended with Dr. Summer Lad, he would say 
this is the, the operation sh should be prohibited, actually. Yes, so Dr. Nabil Dusui was placing a question in the chat uh, location. So he was wondering if it's possible at all to precisely select a patient that can be repaired with a simple von Langenbeck uh, from others that will surely need a modified further technique. So uh, what I understand uh, from uh, Dr. Robert, Dr. Hashem, and Dr. Abul Hassan, so you all think that the furlough procedure should be done uh, regularly and, and do not usually resort to, uh, to, uh, to uh, flat platyplasty at all. Is that correct, Dr. Amdouh? In my opinion, I should be a standard procedure. Furlough should be a standard procedure. With this yes. Dr. Hashem, you think the same? Dr. Hashem, you think furlough should be a standard procedure in all cases? Maybe we lost you to Robertman. I think you, what do you think of that? Should furlough be a standard I, I procedure the, in all cases? Well, I, th I think the, the furlough, it, it gives you four flaps. Buccinator muscles give you six flaps. So if you've got a small cleft, you might get by with just the four flaps of the, of the Z-plasty. Plus, if you're using an intervellar velloplasty type, a straight line closure, you get used to that. And I think it's appropriate to get used to the, to the local rearrangement flaps. So using a, a Z-plasty first is excellent, and you should use that in the small ones and twos. But when you start using the relaxing incisions, whether you're using an intervellar velloplasty or a Z-plasty, the relaxing incisions have the same impact on the face. So that's, that's the issue. The Z-plasty in itself is fine, uh, for the for the uh, soft palate reconstruction and muscle reinterdigitation, but as you proceed to wide uh, Piero band type uh, vo twos or wide vo threes or fours, even in the soft palate, you run out of enough tissue to really do a full anatomic reconstruction, and that's where you add the the uh, the uh, myomucosal flaps, mm -hmm. the buccal fat plaid. I, I totally agree. If you feel comfortable with it, you can use it in that. I just wanted to make a, a comment that if you're going to want to do a buccal flap later, you might have scarred the base. I have had some experience with that. Not a lot, but some. Thank you, Dr. Robertman. Dr. Hashem, um, you're unmuted. Yes. You so uh, I so to you really to answer the, the this question. Um, there was a paper published from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, which was a systematic meta-analysis uh, uh, examining um, um, all cases done either uh, using a two-flap uh, palatoplasty versus the furlough. And uh, what, they, what they concluded is that the patients who did the furlough palatoplasty needed less pharyngeal dysfunction surgery uh, later on. Uh, there are so many comments about this systematic meta-analysis after uh, it was published, uh, but the thing uh, about this which, which made it very credible for me, this, this study, is that the senior author of this study was actually uh, doing a two-flap palatoplasty uh, with an intravelar uh, veloplasty. And once he recognized the, the outcome of his um, study, he was trying to learn the furlough. So this is one thing. The other thing I wanted to uh, comment about the cross uh, restriction, um, I don't believe that the uh, relaxing incisions would cause any uh, cross restrictions. We actually use the um, uh, extensive release uh, in every cleft case, whether it's a VO1, a VO2, and the idea is to have a tensionless uh, closure. The main issue with the, with, with you would find and um, with the gross disturbance is in patients who have severe bilateral cleft lip. Um, if you think about it, how many cases of gross disturbance, class 3 occlusion, have you seen with a VO1 or a VO2 cleft, whatever the type of reconstruction that has been uh, performed. It's very, very minimal. It's very, very rare. It's really the gross disturbance that happens to the maxilla is primarily uh, related to the anterior part of the premaxilla and the tension, the excess tension that you exert when you do a very tense uh, lip repair. 
Thank you, Teresa. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mamdouh some questions from the chat here. Uh, someone is asking uh, why you are using uh, scalpel number 15 and number 11. Is there any specific trick in that? And also, uh, a second question, what uh, do you do in old patients who ha are having hypertrophied uh, protruded wide uh, maxilla? In, um, I think in patients with bilateral cleft lip. First question, um, I use three types of blades, right? actually. I, I use the 15 and the 11. Um, the 15 mainly, I use it when I dissect the uh, muscle from the posterior shelf of the palate. And I use a right at angle um, knife for dissection of the mucosa, especially on the, the right side. Um, whatever you can use comfortably, it's okay. Uh, about the second question, as I, as I showed in the presentation, I believe that uh, the stage repeated for the fear case of production of the perimaxilla is the best uh, solution for them. Uh, my philosophy in that, in the first stage, I care about two things. First is the uh, closure of the nasal floor and the nasoalveolar uh, area. And the secondly is elongation of the uh, uh, filtrum and, and columella. Uh, and at the same time, just attention the muscles to the uh, premaxilla. Does not reach the middle line or even attached to the other side. Uh, by this way, we apply something like a uh, gentle stretch of the muscle so that I can do the final rip repair actually after one and a half or two years. I wait a long. Many surgeons doesn't prefer that and some of the families doesn't prefer that. But my results by this is uh, protocol is very good and gives a, a balanced, nice smile for the upper lip and at the same time, a good nasal projection. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is will be our last question today. Um, someone is asking why you shifted your technique from two flap to uh, furlough technique. Uh, I think we know all the answer for this, but we like to hear from you. Yeah, I can I can show him my even my uh, speech results was a two flap palatoplasty. I had I had a very good results, but this percentage is actually thirty to forty percent to percent. Most of the cases, more than fifty percent we're gonna need a secondary procedure for speech. Uh, if you review the recent textbooks now, it's concluded that the perlu or the Z-plasy, whatever the technique you use, has a better result. Uh, so that's why I refer, I, I changed my practice. Uh, but before I did that, I attended many, uh, workshops and uh, cadaveric courses for for training to do this technique right. It's not an easy way, but if you master it, it you are gonna get a very good result, and you get satisfied on table. Actually, if you see the length of the palate, it on in your hands immediately. It's long enough. So that's why I changed it. And if you have time, I can show you a video for one of my patients uh, who did the two flap palette last year, more than 10 years ago. If you allow me to share, yeah, my, yeah, oh, Ahmed. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mamdouh. Uh, now, Ahmed, can you uh, yes, of course, Dr. Mamdouh, uh, finish our session? I think we have, we have come to an end of, uh, of our time. Uh, maybe you could see your last video 
and we'll be ending this after this video. Please go ahead. This is one of the patients. I did it more than 10 years ago. Uh, the video is not uh, shared. Well, I think, I think, uh, yes, the it's working, but the audio, the audio mm -hmm. is not working. For, uh, I, I think if it's a problem, we could keep that for next Sunday. Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Mdoss, so much for such uh, an interesting night. Um, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that we have uh, come to an end of our time. Uh, I'd like to thank all our attendees, our professors, Dr. Khaled, Dr. Robert Mint, Dr. Mamdouh, Dr. Hashem, uh, my co-host, of course, Dr. Dawlat, uh, Dr. Haysam. Uh, and I hope to see you all next Sunday, same time. Uh, we'll be discussing at that point uh, VPI, its assessment and its management. Uh, Dr. Haysham will be giving us uh, this talk next Sunday at 10 p.m. Cairo local time. I'm going to be posting uh, the time for EST and uh, Pacific time uh, in the announcement. Thank you all. I'm happy to see you tonight and see you next week. Thank, thank you, you Ahmed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you next time again. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.